Whether you want to go one-on-one with an audience, launch a product, host a promotion, or just get back to your grassroots as a brand, the last mile of marketing has always been and will always be putting your product in the customer's hands. And it may not necessarily be a new or novel idea, but it is getting harder and harder to do in a meaningful way. Because gone are the days of propping up a soapbox by the docks and hawking your wares. They're replaced instead by the challenges of sourcing reliable, brand-safe talent to rep your company and coordinating all of the logistical pieces, getting the permits, making sure everything and everyone shows up on time, and that no one pours coffee in their lap in the process. Bottom line, it can be hard to show up in the way that you want to, and therein lies the opportunity, the obstacle. Because if the difference between climbing Everest and sitting at home and playing video games is someone carrying my gear for me, then, well... I'll see you at the top because the obstacle is the way. And if it takes a Sherpa to get you from where you are to where you want to be, then I say on Blay. Welcome to Out of Home Insider, the first podcast for media and marketing executives that connects how offline attention drives conversion. My name is Tim Rowe, and for the past four years, I've been interviewing guests about their unique insights in bridging this misunderstood and undervalued opportunity for brands to create alchemy in the real world. Today's guest is Clay Lundquist. Clay is the founder of Exposure Agents, a network made up of local businesses, event producers, brands, media outlets, and influencers, all existing with the sole purpose of delivering the last mile of marketing. That is, putting your product in the hands of your end consumer so they can try before they buy and so you can sell more stuff. Clay explains the differences between sampling and seeding and how to figure out which one is right for you. He explains how to get started with any budget and how to scale the grassroots element of your brand. Last week, we talked about virtual out of home and how brands show up in the real world. And today is intended as a continuation of that conversation. And frankly, as a continuation in the theme of the blurring between digital and physical experiences, the ability and opportunity to feel something before we buy it whether that's like in episode 126 with Raghav Sharma of Perfectly and Clothing, or in episode 115 with Jason Schuster of BizTech when we talked about how we can use the metaverse as a way to visualize and feel an out-of-home campaign before going offline to make it real. Or just last week in 132 when we talked with David Title about the hierarchy of how brands show up. So that's the big idea I'd like you to continue exploring. How these seemingly unrelated themes fashion, the metaverse, CGI, can all be used to accelerate the challenges among us and further ingrain blue chips. So without further ado, welcome everybody to the Out of Home Insider Show, a podcast like no other, hosted by the one and only Tim Rowe. Get ready to have some knowledge dropped on you and to be entertained because nothing's more valuable than food for your brain. So sit back, relax, we're about to dive in as the best industry podcast is about to begin. Maybe as a starting point, why do you believe, why is it so important for brands to show up in the real world? I think there's a real magic when you actually can touch and feel a, a product. Um, you know, we see so many things advertised online on you know billboards stuff like that but actually being able to go out and be like okay this is what it is i get to play with this i get to taste it i get to you know demo it there's something to that um especially because all these products are costing us money so mm-hmm. actually being able to get it in our hands before we spend the money is a real it's a real opportunity for you know brands to you know tell their customers like we actually care what you think of this this brand as you you know and we want to bring it to you it's funny i don't know how many of the listeners know this but before i before i got into advertising I actually sold cars and we had a saying and that saying was the feel of the wheel is half the deal and it was really to emphasize the importance of getting your customer to take a test drive because they're making a you know, this, right the second largest purchase of our adult lives. So it would make sense that all of the other products in our lives, we would want our customers to experience them as well. 83% of retail is still happening offline in, in a brick and mortar store. When we think about showing up in the real world, and we think about the explosion of direct to consumer, 
where maybe is the opportunity for D2C brands? We see some brands do pop-up shops and some really clever things and executions like that, but is there more on the bone there? It feels like there's an opportunity for D2C to become more real world. Yeah, I think with pop, you know, with D2C, you know, there are other pop-up shops, but that's the 1% that can actually do that. I mean, those are very expensive activations. Um, a lot of, a lot of time goes into it. I talk to different D2C founders all the time and that's not even on their radar or something to do. Maybe be a, a piece in a pop up shop, but not like do their own and actually promote their own. Whereas with events, you can really start with nothing if you want and go. And then it's the moon. Um, you can, if you've got something that's edible, you can go out with, you know, a permit and a wagon and, basically go and sample it to people on the street. That's all you need. You need a really? person that you know, can actually talk about the, the the your brand in the correct way, some product, and start handing it out. And I mean, we've all seen that. It's pretty scrappy. Like That's something that I don't want to say anyone could do, but I mean, I feel, I feel like I could pull that off. Yeah, exactly. And I've seen founders do it. You know, I know founders do it. And the oh, other part of, part of it is, is the other reason to do it is for market research. You should do it as a founder. You mm. should be out there during you know these first things, seeing what people think of your product because you're going to know point. right away, especially with something they can taste or or you know play with. You know you're going to know right away what they feel about it. I mean, on the other side of it, you know if you have a bigger product like I I worked a, a lot with uh, Crossnet. Sure, you just set games out in parks and let people play them. Um, what do you mean, like just work. like? When, so so for folks that don't know, CrossNet, it's the four-way volleyball. I think there's four-way soccer now. Pickleball, it's exploded into a, a whole backyard game franchise. But maybe describe what you mean by that. So setting up the product, in this case, meant what? Setting up the, the, like the volleyball net, the four-way yep. volleyball net, just putting it up in a park. Yeah, we had different variations of our events. But the most simplistic one was we would, you know, literally go and, on a beach somewhere set it up and just kind of wrangle people into play it and interesting we see from that you know people a lot of people are like what what is this and they would come over and play the game and mm. those are potential new customers whether it's the people that are playing it or the people that are you know just going you know walking by it and i've done that with several games at this point you know that um just being able to see what it is versus seeing it online or in an ad is is there's it's a different feeling for people and, you know, that's the, you know, the, the bare bones grassroots version of it. You know, your next version is, you know, becoming a part of an event, you know, sponsoring into an event. And that could be anything from, you know, a, a farmer's market to a festival to, you know, a sporting league. Um, there's all sorts of partnerships you can do and seed through that. And events should be a piece of the puzzle of that. And from a content standpoint, it seems like the sponsorships or, or doing some of these, you know, grassroots, we're going to go set up a, a, a net from a content creation standpoint, you're now able to start leveraging assets around these things, whether that's content created around the sponsorship, content created around people trying this game for the first time. And now we're going to run that. We're going to take that and run that as our social media or paid content. Do you see, yeah. or, or I'm sure that you, you've seen brands execute on a strategy like that. What do you see when you can combine, you, you said that kind of special magic moment in, in the beginning there, but when you can layer those things together, the offline and the digital, it seems like that would be a big unlock. Yeah. I mean, what I like, I really like it when a brand looks at it like an ecosystem with what they're doing as far as events, their ads, their out of home, um, legacy media, things like that. Events is a piece of the puzzle. This is the, we're going to actually be talking to you face to face, I think it's the most intimate of all of them, because you're really with there with a customer or potential customer. Um, and, you know, talking, you know, letting people demo your product or taste it if it's a, a food product. Um, and then that's, that's a piece of the puzzle that probably has come about after they've seen it on a lot online, you know, seen it in social, seen it in ads, seen it out of home. And then if they're, you know, they still haven't bought, the event portion of it is a really good way to get them across the, the, the finish line. Just thinking about kind of like the, the social proof hierarchy where a review is good, right? We, well, a, a review helps me to make a decision. Hey, someone else who has a challenge similar to me made a similar purchase you know, decision to, to solve their, their problem of 
uh, I don't know, maybe it's cappuccino in the morning. Uh, you know, reviews are, are a helpful source. And then we've kind of got user generated content, that grassroots feeling credibility distributed digitally. And then maybe it's a one on one recommendation. But at the top, it is it, it, it always comes back to there is no replacement for putting the thing in your customers hands. Exactly. On that spectrum between maybe like sampling the product or, or and kind of like seeding the market, I think of this story with uh, with Red Bull when they launched and they crushed up a bunch of empty cans and stuffed them into garbage cans around stores where they sold Red Bull, kind of seeding the market, if you will, for for you know purchasing. Hey, there's a bunch of demand here for Red Bull. You should get some too. How do you think about those two different things, sampling versus seeding? What's what's kind of the playbook between those? I think it just depends on the product. You know, um, sampling is mainly with the food stuff, you know, something that's a, a, pa- a package good or, you know, from a, 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 a restaurant type place okay. like, you know, your McDonald's of the world, uh, places like that. They can do sampling, um, you, you know, things like a granola bar, gum, sodas. Anything you can find in the in the grocery store, not anything, but a lot of things you can find, specifically snacks, are sampled, you know? And I've even done stuff with uh, a brand, you know, where it was, it's called Almond Accents, it's, okay. you know, from a palm brand, and it's the almonds that go on your salad. So oh. we set up at high-end food, sh- food shows and food uh, festivals and made salads for people with Almond Accents on them. So it doesn't just have to be your product. Your, it was a pe- the product that we were promoting were a piece of a bigger you know, sample. like the thing. Complimenting it. You know, actually being like, it would have been a different experience if we would have said, hey, here's a you know a little cup full of almonds. Well, everybody knows what that tastes like. Well, we gave it to them on a salad that, you know, we, you know, spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, the right, the right salad for each event. And now they're like, okay, I really get how this works mm. um, and, you know, what the, what the benefit is. So that's so, sampling. Yep. How is that different than seeding? Seeding, I, I look at it for products that you, you know, that aren't, you know, you can't really taste them, you know, have the taste and feel. So, you know, take a game, take a, you know, some kind of technology, um, you know, any kind of product, a car, like ride and drives, you know, or, you know, you put a car out at a, at a, a, a baseball game and, you know, just kind of let people, you know, get in it, feel it, stuff like that. Um, anything like that, that's kind of on the bigger spectrum, um, that's more seating. You're putting it into a place where it makes sense for those, those, that group. What are, may, maybe I'm a, I'm a team that has, scaled beyond a few people i have product market fit i've i've kind of gotten past the handcrafted founder stage and i want to look at bringing in a team to help enable some of the execution here what are the things maybe the potential pitfalls what are the things that most commonly go wrong or 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 that we should keep an eye out for if we're thinking about using events as a part of the puzzle Sure. I think the biggest thing is just not knowing what your actual goal is. Oh, that's interesting. Um, is your is your goal to, you know, get it out to the most people possible? Is your goal to get the right people? Um, it's just like it's like any other kind of advertising. And, you know, finding places that fit. Um so the actual because venue. not every yeah, venue or, you know, someplace that fits because not every brand should be in every place. You know, you see places that they're, you know, shoehorning a, a brand into something and you're like, I don't really understand how this makes sense for me being at a soccer game, mm. you know, when I'm looking at some, some brand. Mm-hmm. Why you know, is, why is my talk, electrical talk contracting company? Yeah. At this yeah. soccer tournament. Yeah, exactly. You know, somebody talked them into it and maybe they're just fans, but that's probably a lot of the problem with some kinds of events is, as well as, you know, sponsorships is brands. They're doing it for two reasons. One is the one you hope for is they're doing it for, um, you know, to, to sell more product, to, you know, really get it out there. The other is they're doing it because, you know, they think it's cool and it looks good. Mm -hmm. Either way is great for the person selling the sponsorship, but both, not both of them are that beneficial to the brand. Which I guess really it, it can, and that comes back to sort of the brand risk elements of maybe not showing up in the way that people are going to expect you to show up potentially just missing the mark completely. No one even notices, right? That 
Yep. I, I guess the the worst than that scenario is someone does notice and they ha- and they're they're you know off put by it. But uh, you know, one level better than that is just no one notices, and that's obviously not the outcome that anyone wants. So it makes sense to to get those alignment pieces right. Organic and yeah. gorilla versus sponsored. So so we 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 got the venue right. We've got the the targeting right. We know what our objective is by doing this. What's your take on doing things kind of unsanctioned versus the uh, the official route? We'll say. I think both have a both have a. a a clear, you know, ad- there's advantage to both. I mean, events, once you go on the sponsorship route can get very expensive and you're not going to see a clear ROI a lot mm-hmm. of the times because you just can't, uh, it's really hard, you know, if you're sampling Gatorade to be like, okay, how is this, did this drive a lot of sales for us? It's right. really hard to tell. Um, so you could spend, you know, a boatload of money and not really be able to pinpoint it back to wins. Now, I my view of that is, Again, it's a piece of the puzzle. So you're not going to get a clear view, but it also is going to um, be one of those things where you're just another thing in the ecosystem of, okay, they saw the ad, they saw the billboard, now they saw the event, maybe they went by. So it kind of gets split up between that. Doing stuff gorilla is cheaper, but you, you're looked at a, not quite the same mm. way. It's not quite the same thing as if you have, you know, a cool setup or a tr- vehicle or something like that. And you're supposed to be in front of this festival or at this game. If you're, you know, the person rolling through there, yeah, people will take it and they'll try it. But you're not looked at as kind of the same, like you're supporting that festival or you're supporting that team, stuff like that. So it just kind of depends what you want. Now, it's like I said, it's a very cheap way to get product into people's hands. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I mean, sure. I would do it all day as long as you do it by the book. <laughs> and it would seem there's there's probably a lot of brands out there too that that's part of their kind of brand makeup is being a little bit disruptive and a little bit against the grain. I, you know, I'm thinking about a, a great campaign years ago by by a friend, uh, uh, All Terrain. Shout out Adam. Um, they worked with. It was specifically with with Converse with Chuck T- and they were mm-hmm. doing this cool street execution and turning uh, pictures of people in the shoes into wheat pastings, and it was it was a totally guerrilla execution. But it made sense; it was aligned to the brand and obviously that street culture. So, it seems like there's there's an opportunity for brands to align to some things like that. But it's an important consideration of where do you want to fall on that on that spectrum. Um, and how do you want yeah, brands to perceive, lot, or how do you want your yeah. customers to perceive you? Yeah, and a lot of you know those things like that they they can they can look organic. They might not be. You might have permission. That's a great like point. you know, a lot of people will do like make it um, look organic. Yeah, they'll do like uh, digital um, like digital projections on buildings and stuff like that. And you're kind of like, oh, that's cool. They just kind of went out in there and, and did that. You know, kind of like graffiti. But no, they they've got permission. It's permitted. You know, sure. they, they've done it. it permitted, all these things. So you can have that kind of crossover. So you can kind of seem like, you know, the, the bad boy, but you did dot the I's and cross the T's to to get it right, done. You're still a Fortune 500 company and you don't want to end up uh, you know, on the evening yeah. news and getting sued. Because the, the worst thing about doing something straight guerrilla is if you put a lot of time and money and effort, you know, whether it's through your own company or your agency, is that getting it shut down before you even begin. Makes sense. So... And that can happen, you know, in Gorilla. So you do want to, you know, kind of, there's some checks and balances you want to take care of with, with Gorilla even. Well, Kai, I, I'm sure you're working on a lot of stuff that's top secret and we'll find about find out about after the fact. But maybe give folks a, a little bit of an idea of the things that you're working on. What, uh, Where is your attention actively these days? What projects can you maybe tell us a little bit about? Clay, I'm sure you're you're working on a lot of top secret stuff that we won't find out about until after it's happened. But maybe uh, maybe share with us some of the projects that what's maybe something that you're working on actively right now. Uh, get the juices flowing for for folks now. They've got this master's class on events. What are you working on? Yeah, so right now, I mean, on the experiential side, which is the event side, um, you know, my my main focus is on a couple brands. One of them is a brand that's been with us for um, over a decade now, uh, McDonald's. They, with them, you know, we've created several different um, activations over the years. But right now, our biggest one is around a food truck. 
So we are out sampling, you know, our world famous fries as well, well as other products and, you know, different things that are, you know, coming out. Um, we also utilize the vehicle and other setups to promote, you know, different different things they're promoting, like delivery and um, their app and things like that. So it's interesting to think about, obviously, McDonald's is iconic and does not need to do that additional element. They don't need to do that. They're still going to serve billions and billions. But there becomes a, a level of obligation, almost, almost the responsibility once your brand has transcended that level to I just think about as you're saying that, like the last time I've I had McDonald's French fries, I, I really couldn't tell you, probably a decade and a half. But as you're saying that, I'm thinking about all the memories I had going there with my family, with my sisters, going to play plays, going there with friends. Like it's a piece of Americana, frankly. Exactly. Exactly. That's probably our biggest thing right now, as well as we've got some other clients that we're working on that we do um, you know, samplings. We've got a couple people we're just helping doing um on the sponsorship side and working with, you know, actual founders and bringing founders and sponsors together mm. in, in uh, smaller events. So I do a little bit of everything when it comes to it. I kind of one of those people that gets bored. Uh, even this, <clears throat> this past weekend, I, uh, you know, produced a festival and, you know, part of doing that festival was working with brands to figure out the best way for them to um, activate and get to oh, cool. the attendees at the festival. That's I guess, coming full circle on the idea of last mile marketing, bringing that connection back into the festival. How can we connect your brand with the people that are here? Clay, I can't thank you enough for being here and sharing as much as you have. We use Latin long to give the directionals in the real world. Give folks the Latin long. Where can they get in touch with you? Learn more about what you do. I mean, the easiest place to get me is uh, I've got... uh... Clay at exposureagents.com. That's where I really, you know, promote the sampling and the seeding of different products, specifically working with, uh, you know, a couple large brands, but I'm really getting into working with the, the smaller D2C founders and things like that because I think there's a, there's a real need for them right now. Um, I'm not a big social guy, but you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find them. That's, that's how I originally found Clay many moons ago, many moons ago. And uh, it's, a, it's an exciting time, especially now to see as many new brands coming into trying things like events. Clay, I know this is going to be a helpful resource for a lot of folks. So thank you again. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Appreciate it. If you found this to be helpful, please share it with someone who could benefit. As always, make sure to smash that subscribe button. And wherever you're listening, leave the podcast review. That's how you help us grow. See y'all next time. Quarter century, I finally came to my senses. I finally got my hand up on the tinted Benz kid. I see the world clear through my tinted lenses. With the dream and the drive, the possibilities endless. Now print that, send this all the way to Tokyo. Take a trip down south, down to Mexico. Next stop, Shanghai, the world class trade show. First class all the way, cause that's how we roll. Yeah, call us the rock star businessman. Rocking shows we handle business, man. We got our own future in the palm of our hands, cause. Divided we fall and together we stand